next order of uh, testimony that we have before us today is, uh, let's see, we have Mr. Stenholm, Mr. Or Orton, and Mr. Uh, Peterson. Uh, if you gentlemen would like to come as a panel and... Uh, We would like to, reckon, uh, to uh, welcome you to the, uh, to the committee. Uh, needless to say, the three of you and uh, the Democrat coalition uh, uh, think a lot like I do and, uh, on certain issues. And uh, it's always a welcome uh, to have you come before this, uh, this committee. So please feel free to summarize. Uh, your entire statements would appear in the record without objection. And uh, Mr. Orton, I guess you would lead off. Uh, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we do appreciate the opportunity to appear before you and members of the committee uh, to make a request that a uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute uh, that which we have submitted to the committee be made in order for debate on the floor. I would uh, like to start out by commending you. Uh, you indicated that uh, we agree in many areas. In fact, we do. and. Uh, as one of the handful of members who in the last session of Congress voted for the Solomon budget, which would balance the budget in five years, I will tell you that I would have been distressed had you not had an opportunity to present that budget on the floor of the House. I would have been distressed that the important issues that were debated and focused upon in, in your budget was, would not have been available for public uh, disclosure and debate and uh, the policy decisions uh, which we had an opportunity to discuss and make as a result of that budget, it would have distressed me had the Rules Committee in the last session of Congress not allowed you to take that budget to the floor. Under that same, under that same concern, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would ask you to uh, allow our budget uh, just as your budget in the past has been allowed to be taken to the floor, I would ask you to allow our budget to be taken to the floor. I uh, have had an opportunity to serve as a task force chairman dealing with the budget uh, resolution for the coalition. Uh, we have prepared what we believe is a, a very substantial document, a reasonable document. It presents significant policy uh, differences uh, for debate and discussion. It does meet the one objective that the speaker set forward, and that is to balance in the year 2002. Our proposal, the coalition budget, does in fact balance by 2002 and in fact produces a, or a, uh, a surplus in the year 2002. We do so actually producing $160 billion less in debt than the Kasich budget does. Over the seven-year period of time, we will spend $160 billion less under this budget than under the Kasich proposal. Also, uh, we do not postpone deficit reduction or require unreasonable spending cuts necessary to pay for a tax cut within this bill. We are not opposed to a tax cut. We have a, a sense of the Congress resolution uh, in our amendment which uh, in fact says that if we meet the deficit reduction targets, that tax cuts should be uh, enacted. But we believe that we should cut spending first before um, actually engaging in uh, cutting taxes. We're very concerned about the two-step reconciliation process under the uh, Kasich proposal, where in the first step, uh, the tax bill would be reconciled and the more easy spending cuts would be reconciled with the promise that later on uh, we would have a second reconciliation bill to deal with the entitlement cuts, the uh, Medicare cuts, which clearly will be the most difficult cuts. And we're very concerned that this approach may in fact reflect what occurred in the decade of the 1980s. As we promised the public, uh, Congress said we will cut taxes and cut spending and balance the budget. They cut taxes. They never got around to cutting spending. They increased spending. And three and a half trillion dollars later, uh, we're back to the table again. And so we do not oppose tax cuts, but we believe that we should cut spending first. Our uh, uh, proposal has several differences uh, from the Kasich proposal. We also slow the rate of growth in Medicare, uh, but we do so more slowly. Uh, in fact, uh, our proposal would uh, spend $109 billion more in Medicare over the next nine years. 
uh, we reduce Medicare spending or the growth in Medicare sufficient to uh, keep the... Well, the gentleman yield for a moment. You said over the next nine years. Is this seven, I'm, yeah, okay. Pardon me. I'm in seven years. And with the gentleman also, he said uh, 109 billion uh, more than what? More than in the Kasich proposal. The Kasich proposal, I believe, is $283 billion in cuts. Ours would be $174 billion in cuts, uh, actually, from the baseline. Uh, those are not actual cuts in spending, as you know. It is a reduction from the baseline if current law is left in place and no change is made. Um, that is sufficient to keep the, uh, the Medicare trust fund solvent through the projection period. We believe that it's necessary uh, in the short term to cut spending sufficiently so that the, the trust fund can remain solvent. However, we recognize that it's going to take uh, systemic health care reform in order to actually resolve the, uh, the crisis uh, in spending in both Medicare and Medicaid. Our proposal assumes, as does the Kasich proposal, that Medicaid would be put into a block grant to the states, but uh, our proposal slows the growth at a more reasonable rate. Uh, it reduces the growth in Medicaid to 8% in 96, 7% in 97 and 98, 6% in 99 and 2000, and then down to 5% in 2001 and thereafter. Uh, that achieves $137 billion in savings over the seven years, which is $50 billion less in, in reductions from the baseline than the Republican budget. Also, our budget continues the promise to uh, help uh, our uh, young people in this country achieve higher education. Uh, it does not cut the $18.7 billion uh, uh, from guaranteed student loans as the Republican budget. It also incorporates the, uh, what was called the, uh, the Deal Welfare Reform Bill, the Coalition Welfare Reform, which the Democrats uh, supported uh, unanimously in, in March, and it fully funds uh, that welfare reform provision. It also provides $35 billion more than the Republican uh, budget in Function 500, which includes education programs, Head Start, job training, and so forth. It also provides $11 billion more than the Republicans in Function 550, enabling restoration of funds for child health and immunization, rural health, and NIH research. It also provides $6 billion more than Republicans in Function 450, which includes many economic development programs such as community development block grants. It also reduces the cuts in agriculture. These are real cuts, not from the baseline, but from a freeze. The uh, Republican proposal would cut, uh, I believe, $9 billion. Uh, our proposal uh, reduces those cuts to only $3.4 billion. Uh, recognizing that agriculture is one of the few areas in our budget which has taken real cuts uh, over the past several years, um, we believe that, uh, uh, that we can, in fact, continue to lower spending, but we believe that the uh, Republican approach would, in fact, decimate American agriculture and uh, would put our, our farmers uh, at such a disadvantage in the international markets and our own markets that uh, they would not be able uh, to survive. So we believe that our budget uh, accomplishes the same goal, that is, a uh, balanced budget by the year 2002. It does so in a more reasoned, less drastic approach. It allows us to reduce the rate of growth more slowly uh, and more achievably, I might add, in Medicare and Medicaid. It allows us to uh, bring down more reasonably spending uh, in our priority programs. So where we are actually spending more money over the coming seven years than the Republican uh, leadership bill, our bill actually reduces overall spending over the seven years by over $160 billion greater than the, uh, the Republican alternative. So um, we, we believe that it is a very substantive bill. We believe that it meets the requirements, and we would ask the committee to make it in order so that those people who believe that we should cut spending first and believe that we should keep our promises have an opportunity to vote on that on the floor. 
Um, also with me today, uh, uh, several of my colleagues, two of my colleagues from the Budget Committee, uh, Congressman Charlie Stenholm uh, from Texas and Glenn Browder from Alabama are here, and I believe both of them would like to address the committee. And also uh, Colin Peterson from Minnesota is here, who is our uh, uh, head of policy for the coalition. So, uh, Colin. Colin, would you like to begin? <coughs> Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to uh, be with you to today. Uh, I, first of all, uh, as uh, chair of policy for the coalition, we have a number of task forces, and I just want to say how proud we are of the work that uh, Bill Orton and the other members have done uh, in putting together what we think is a very reasonable, uh, re well thought out uh, proposal. <clears throat> as you're probably aware, uh, they didn't receive the numbers until five o'clock on Friday and had to have the uh, information over here by 5 on Monday and did an outstanding job. So uh, I want to, to be them to be recognized for the work that they've done. Uh, we did have one problem, Mr. Chairman. I think that you have a sheet that uh, <clears throat> and I think uh, with, with no criticism, Mr. Kasich had some problems like this. We had some technical problems with the, the uh, reconciliation instructions that were sent over to the committee. And I believe your staff has uh, the uh, yes. these changes and so without if we could get unanimous consent or however the process works to get those incorporated to make those changes uh, the government reform and ways and means changes are technical the veterans benefits were incorrect we want to re reinstate them to k6 numbers which is what was intended mm -hmm. Uh, we, we are in a hearing and not, not in a position to uh, have unanimous consent statements, but uh, we will certainly take that into consideration, okay. and we do have your page. I appreciate that. <clears throat> um, and I just want to re reiterate what uh, our ch uh, chairman said here, that uh, many, many members, I think, on both sides of the aisle feel like we ought to be cutting spending before we uh, look at tax cuts and, and some of these other measures. And I think it would be a real tragedy if they didn't get the opportunity to vote on that type of a budget. Uh, we put something together here that uh, we think is well thought out. It's on a glide path that uh, is more of a straight line to a balanced budget. One of the criticisms of, I have of, of some of the other proposals is that they, they kind of go up and then they come down uh, at the end uh, more steeply. And I think ours is more achievable, manageable, and uh, uh, is more likely to, to happen. And so uh, we would like the opportunity to to vote on a, a substitute uh, that can get the spending cuts in, pla in place first. We are not against tax cuts. As Bill has said, uh, in our uh, uh, substitute, we have a sense of the Congress that we would uh, like to look at tax cuts in the area of, of economic uh, growth and capital formation once we are to zero and once we have a balanced budget. Now, the other thing I'd like to reiterate, uh, those of us that come from uh, farm country, uh, you know, we've taken 60% cuts in farm programs. Uh, the Kasich budget is asking for another 40% cut. We just think that that is beyond what is fair. And so we've restored uh, those cuts to something that uh, we don't like, but uh, we can live with. And uh, frankly, uh, I think if, if we have cuts of the level that's being talked about, you're going to be in a situation where there's going to be some real talk about just eliminating the farm programs and also eliminating some of the conservation and environmental benefits that go along with them. So I think we're in a dangerous area there. And also those of us that uh, represent rural areas uh, and have very Medicare dependent hospitals, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, it's very important uh, that we be able to try to get uh, those Medicare cuts back to a level that we think we can live with. Uh, and for all of these reasons, uh, we think that uh, this should be made in order so that people can have an alternative to address the concerns that they have from their area. And uh, we appreciate your consideration. Mr. Stenholm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Delighted to be here. Great day to come before the Budget Committee, uh, having met the admonition. The, the Rules Committee. Rules Committee. Today, the Budget Committee. <laughs> I make the same mistake in reverse. Too, <laughs> the, the, the Rules Committee with the, the admonition that Members are strongly advised to submit only amendments which provide for a balanced budget not later than the year 2002. What Mr. Orton has described to you meets that criteria totally. And I commend the chairman uh, for uh, this approach because uh, it's not surprising to me that uh, your uh, verbiage meets your actions. And as one who has in the past supported your budget on occasion, when it was a made in order under the Rules Committee to come forward, 
Uh, I was happy to support you when you were doing that and feel quite certain that you will be supporting this coalition approach today in the same spirit in which in the past we have seen amendments that you and others have proposed. We have met the requirements of a balanced budget in 2002. Frankly, we've done it by borrowing a lot of the good work of Senator Domenici, the committee, and, and uh, Mr. Kasich. And I uh, publicly again say that uh, I commend John Kasich, Chairman of the Budget Committee, for the manner in which he has conducted himself in doing a very difficult task. Mr. Chairman, uh, we are also so enthusiastic about our deficit reduction zeal in what we presented to you last night that we included both on and off budget numbers. And I brought with me the resolution pages which separate out the off-budget numbers and would like to submit those to the committee for incorporation into the substitute. We appreciate the committee's indulgence in that matter also. And Mr. Chairman, finally, uh, I've, as I said, I've always appreciated the encouragement that you lent, particularly last year to the Frog Group when we organized the Fair Rules Organizing Group and our concern about amendments, who was allowed to do what and when. And you supported us then, we supported you then. And you did so believing that it was important for all reasonable amendments to be considered on the House floor. And we believe that our substitute presents an important alternative for members of the House to consider and respectfully request that it be made in order. And I, I would not repeat, Mr. Orton has summarized as best he could uh, and uh, in a short period of time. And we believe that upon a close analysis that there will be many members on both sides of the aisle that will feel, find this approach much more doable as well as practical and fair of any proposal that we'll consider tomorrow and the next day. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Browder, from Alabama. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, would like to thank uh, Mr. Orton and Ms. Peterson, Mr. Stenholm, and all the members of the coalition task force who have worked on this budget. I also uh, must say, Mr. Chairman, that uh, whereas I do not anticipate that you will support our budget, uh, I would like to have you, your support. Oh, you, you never you, can tell. You, you must, uh, I think sometime in the last few days, you must have gone home after uh, our long days here. You must have gone home, walked into your house late at night, gone uh, into your house and found a closet, opened the door and stepped in, shut the door behind you, and smiled. <laughs> That's because he thought it was the elevator. <laughs> Be because you're seeing presented to you on right. uh, both sides now a, a budget that you probably would have never uh, dreamed of before. That's right. Mr. Chairman, the main difference there is a, a major difference between the budget that we're offering today and the uh, House leadership budget. And to borrow from my friend John Kasich, some of his rhetoric, let it be declared here today, let it be heard here today, and let it be noted here today that we are delivering on a commitment that we have made over the years. And that commitment is included in this bill that meets the criterion of balancing the budget by the year 2002. And the major difference between our budget, or the key difference for me between our budget and the House leadership budget, is the tax cut issue. I recall the uh, words that you spoke uh, just 30 minutes, 45 minutes ago. The American people are not dumb. I've gone out with John Kasich uh, across America with these budget hearings, from uh, Arizona, Ohio, New Jersey, uh, Montana. I didn't go to South Carolina, but he asked my question for me. And we asked the simple crowds of people, would you rather have a tax cut now, or would you rather have those savings applied to deficit reduction? And they said, overwhelmingly, four, five, ten to one, by show of hands, that they would prefer to have it applied to deficit reduction. When it was, a, when it was pushed, pursued a little further with them, when it was not just uh, an either-or vote, they said, they told us that they would prefer to forego the tax cut. All of us like tax cuts. We're for some of these tax cuts. But they said, we would prefer that you forego this tax cut and apply the money 
to our national family mortgage. That's what they told us. I think if you look at any poll, the American people are telling us that, the American uh, business leaders are telling that, and American economists are telling us that. So that's the, the key difference. Because we do that, we can make some changes to uh, modify some of the impacts of the House leadership budget. I think that the budget that we are offering is a different budget. I think it's an honest difference from what the House leadership is proposing. And I ask, we ask, that this committee see fit to let the people's representatives pass judgment on the budget that we're proposing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield whatever time, uh, <laughs> uh, whatever time I have. I'm done. <laughs> I, uh, Mr. Brewster from Oklahoma was a member of our task force at a, um, a hearing uh, dealing with wildlife refuge in his district and couldn't be here. Uh, so I have a statement. Without uh, objection, yeah. it will appear in the record in its entirety. <clears throat> Gentlemen, let me uh, first of all uh, commend uh, each of you and, uh, and members of your coalition for your uh, past support uh, since day one back in January when we've been debating some very, very critical issues, issues that we were never able to debate on this floor in years past. And I know that many of you, like me, uh, felt we were gagged, uh, that we weren't given the opportunity to really pursue those things that meant so much to so many of us. And uh, whether you're talking about tort reform, product liability, wetlands, all, just a myriad of, of issues, uh, regulatory reform, uh, we've had that opportunity in the last 100 days. And much of the support uh, for passage of those bills came from you and your coalition. And I deeply, ooh, hang on there. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, for one, really uh, appreciate that. Secondly, uh, you do have a, a, a very reasonable alternative. Um, and isn't it a great day, though? And uh, Glenn, you said it. I did walk in that closet and close the door. And uh, you do have to smile because... As I told John Kasich earlier on today, you know, before we used to debate the issue of whether we would have a, even a balanced budget offering on the floor to even consider. And just think, tomorrow and Thursday, that's all we're going to have on the floor, if I have anything to say about it, is balanced budget uh, proposals uh, with whichever way that, uh, that we see fit. Yours uh, uh, does not include tax cuts. Uh, I, for one, have some sympathy with that. Uh, I believe that we could, uh, that we could only incorporate uh, tax cuts that would really stimulate the economy. And I think perhaps that might be all that we should consider. Uh, uh, in my own budget that I will be presenting, and I haven't had too much to say about that, and I won't until I become a witness, um, we, uh, we do incorporate the tax cuts, but we say that if they are not in the final document, but it becomes the budget of this Congress, that all of the savings will go towards deficit reduction and not towards some other programs. Um, so uh, I don't know what we're, uh, what we're going to consider here today. As you know, there have been uh, six uh, budgetary proposals before us. Uh, in years past, um, under the uh, Democrat control of this committee, they've seen fit to make in order two Republican and two Democrat uh, proposals, uh, sometimes even less than that. Uh, and, um, but I would, uh, I would hope that we could look favorably on, uh, on your request. And I hope we're going to have a really meaningful debate on the floor of this Congress to talk about the real problems facing this nation. And it is the deficit of this nation. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that is compassionate about saddling my children and my grandchildren and children not even born yet, yours included, with this kind of debt. It's going to ruin this country. It's going to bring us to our knees. So I commend you for coming before us. I uh, uh, hope that we're going to be able to uh, have a meaningful debate on the floor of the Congress, and we'll be recessing this meeting uh, before we make that final decision and discussing it with uh, Mr. Moakley and the, uh, the other minority members, and we'll see what we can do. Having said all that, let me yield to my good friend, uh, the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, I didn't hear all of your testimony, but there was a question before you came to testify whether your name was going to be on the substitute. Sent home. Is your name going to be on the substitute? Yes, sir. My my. This is the coalition bill. 
I would not be here at this moment were I not for the bill that we have submitted for your consideration. I don't know where that rumor got circulated, but uh, Mr. Orton is the chairman of the coalition's task force on the budget. Mr. Orton's name is the name that should have been submitted as one name on behalf of the task force and now of the coalition because it's now an official position of the coalition. And I'm proud to be a part of that fine August. Well, I know you're a team and all of you do a good job. Let me ask you a question and you ask the chairman a, ch a question. Uh, will you support our bill? Will I support the House of Aaron, Leadership? The, the, the I'm budget resolution. Uh, if you'll support mine, Mr. President, uh, Mr. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I, I think, uh, Mr. Quillen, I'm, I'm going to have to study that bill a little, a little further. I, I think we certainly would support the committee making it in order to go to the floor. Yes. I don't think there's any question about that. <laughs> but anyway, we all have different ideas. I personally believe and have always supported that if we have a tax reduction, we stimulate our economy. And if you don't have a tax reduction and you do a lot of sharp knife cutting, I don't know where that's going to lead us. But anyway, you all have the answers and the solution, I'm sure. And I look forward to debating you, listening to your debate on the floor. <coughs> Hopefully the committee will make your substitute in order. I commend all four of you for the diligent work that you do and have at it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moakley. Uh, I want to congratulate you for the outstanding job, but I, I wouldn't think it'd be any less than outstanding when I look at the panel that has worked so hard on this. And I think you're absolutely right. I think the, the minimum that you should be granted is a position uh, so that you can take this up on the floor of the House and I'll do anything I can to see that that happens. Mr. Goss. How, uh, how closely does this uh, parallel the Domenici budget on the other side? And from the way you described it, and, and I, I'm, this is not a particularly artful question, I'm, I'm reading the Stenholm Amendment as it is presented in our notes, and this, these notes are obviously no longer valid because they were dated at 8.45 this morning, and anything dated is actually at 9.30 this morning, and anything dated at 9.30 this morning is already history and gone. Um, I think I got most of everything you said in your outline, and I think it's pretty close to what it says here under Stenholm, but um, you've got a CPI and adjusted on minus five, is that, uh, that you're going that way? Our, our assumption is that in 1999, BLS would recommend a reduction in the CPI right. of minus 0.5. Right. Uh, the Kasich assumption is minus 0.6. Right. The Domenici assumption is minus 0.2. Okay, that's, that's exactly the kind of questions I was getting at. Um, I, I'm not as familiar. I've seen, read more about uh, Domenici in a newspaper than I have uh, in any legislative text, obviously. Um, uh, Medicare. Uh, you explained 193 versus uh, you. There are different numbers than what I have here under Stenholm. No, under um, under Medicare, I don't have the uh, Domenici uh, proposal under Medicare. The Senate uh, cut. I do have the comparison between the coalition and the Kasich. Uh, proposal and um, the Kasich proposal reduces from baseline. I oh, okay, it's off baseline. Off that's of why. Baseline. Okay, that's one of my numbers. Reduces are from baseline 283 billion. Right. The coalition budget reduces from baseline 174 billion. Right. So it's 109 billion less of a reduction from baseline than the Kasich bill, but both continue to grow, so they are not cuts from 95 levels. No, they're, they're slowing growth. They're neither of them growth, are cuts, exactly. right? Okay. The, uh, I can also give you the numbers uh, for Medicaid, the total numbers. Yeah. Um, the uh, coalition uh, budget 
uh, reduces spending, uh, but reduces it at $50 billion. It's actually $49.5 billion less than the, the Kasich budget. Okay. Uh, on a Demo the, uh, you include the Democrat welfare reform bill. I don't have a figure on that. It was scored at about 20 billion. It was somewhere around 20 to 25 billion in savings. Okay. It was scored in savings at around 20 to 25 billion. I believe the Republican approach was scored in savings at around 60 to 70 billion. The difference is represented in our. our right. Policy. Obviously, you've made it up. Uh, or, Done it. And um, education, you've got uh, 35 billion more, according to this Stenholm. Is that accurate? Uh, again, in, I'm, in I'm reading off my paper. Yes. And let's see. I, and ag, you're up uh, three billion for ag programs. It's six billion. Six. Okay. I'm sorry. I apologize. We we have got so many different pieces right. of paper, and I'm trying to do justice, and I haven't right. seen your uh, proposal the, the before. The uh, budget would cut. Nine billion. The coalition budget would cut three point four billion. Right. So difference of six. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's useful information. And thank you very much for bringing this forward. One other thing, uh, Mr. Chairman, the uh, Mr. In, in the Domenici budget, uh, the, the, he has a hundred and seventy billion dollar reserve that he saves for a tax cut. And one of the ways that we're able to do what we're doing here is, is we've allocated those into these different categories. So that's another major difference with Domenici. But you mentioned surplus. Charlie, too. Yeah, I, I just quickly did a calculation uh, here based on the, on the numbers on Medicare, and we add 109 to the House Republican budget for Medicare. We add approximately 60 to Domenici. So Domenici is 49 billion easier on oh, Medicare right. than the House budget, and uh, we're 109 billion easier on Medicare. And with reference to the, the surplus, um, to the uh, 170 billion, right. uh, Domenici does include a surplus which is earmarked or targeted to pay for tax reductions. Um, ours, I guess, as you look at it, that $160 billion that we have um, actually reduces spending over the seven years. So as you look at the total amount of money that is spent by the federal government under the Kasich budget for seven years, and you compare it to the total amount of money spent under the coalition budget for seven years, the coalition budget spends $160 billion less. They both come to balance in 2002, but the coalition budget spends $160 billion less than the Kasich budget over that time period. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. For Mr. Your... Bielenson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You need to be congratulated for your work. It makes all the sense in the world. And I'd, I'd join your coalition in a minute if it weren't for the fact that it'd probably get me in serious trouble back home. <laughs> no, I just have two questions. Join and we'll help you out. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I just I have two questions, if I might. And with respect to the first one, I think Glenn, Glenn Browder answered it before, but let me rephrase it or ask it once more. You are able to reach a balanced budget in seven years, as the Kasich majority proposal does, uh, but in a less, by incorporating uh, less painful cuts and, and, and you know, less difficult cuts than, than his budget assumes. Is the sole reason for that, or virtually the sole reason, and certainly the principal cause, but is the sole reason that you don't have to find the money to pay for tax cuts? Principally, that's uh, where the money comes from. Uh, the $160 billion in additional reduction of the debt, the $100 billion more in Medicare, $100 billion more in Medicaid, the $35 billion more in education, $11 billion more in health. Uh, yes, so it comes up those, to about the $345 those, those to the 350 come from the $350 billion yeah. in tax cuts, yes. That makes it kind of obvious, really, the way we ought to be going, at least at the outset, by reducing the deficit and reducing taxes later on if we're able to do it. And the second question, if I may, is just something, Bill, that you referred to at the outset, which, frankly, I, had not, I hadn't realized was, was the case, and I don't think we'd had testimony on it earlier today, but you mentioned what, what you said was a two-step reconciliation process assumed by, by Mr. Kasich. Uh, I don't think anybody spoke to that. I don't think anybody, anybody pointed that out to us. Do they not? Uh, assume a single reconciliation bill? Do they specifically say they're going to do it in two steps? Yes, they do. They uh, say that there will be two reconciliations. 
The first reconciliation will reconcile the tax cuts and approximately 60% of the overall spending cuts. And mainly the discretionary spending. Mainly discretionary, some of the entitlement. I'm uh, sorry we didn't. I don't know why it hadn't been brought to our attention before or why some of us missed it. But I mean, that would, should have been the principal thing we should have been asking Mr. Kasich about. You're absolutely correct. The problem several years ago, a dozen or so more now, is that we made the tax cuts and we didn't make the more difficult spending cuts. And we, I mean, we're crazy, and I would say exactly. this to our Republican friends as well, to put ourselves in that same position again. I mean, you can just predict what will happen. I mean, people will make the tax cuts, they'll make the, some of the easier spending cuts, and they'll shy away from the, you know, the difficult ones, which both you and Mr. Kasich have been courageous enough to, to try to deal with in Medicaid and, and Medicare. But we've got to do the latter if we're to have a serious impact on the deficit. And if somehow we do the rest and not that, it's going to be even worse. The situation is going to be even worse than the one we find ourselves in now. I mean, that's, I would make that the, the strongest point in arguing against the, the majority proposal on the budget. I mean, I had no... I simply did not realize that they were assuming and were intending to go with a two-step reconciliation uh, process. I mean, that's, as Mr., as our esteemed speaker would say, is grotesque. Well, Mr. Bielenson, uh, we, in fact, do believe that if you're going to climb out of a $5 trillion hole, you don't start by digging yourself no, $700 yeah. billion deeper. And you also don't repeat the mistakes of the past. Of if we repeat the history of the 1980s, where taxes were cut and spending never was cut, uh, you not only fail to solve the problem, now you continue to dig deeper in the hole. That's right. Well, we thank you very much for your testimony and for your efforts to produce a, an alternative, which to some of us at least makes a lot more sense even than, than Mr. Kasich's, uh, even though he worked very hard at his, too. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Lender. I'll just be very brief. Uh, I, I think those lessons of the 80s went into the 90s with the 1993 budget agreement as well that uh, took all the savings we had in cuts in defense and put it into increased spending and social spending. Um, and it was another case where the spending cuts were to come later and they didn't come. I want to ask you why you don't see any benefit in for the economy in some kind of tax cuts. Uh, I will grant that the tax cuts for the child care, the child tax credit are not particularly exciting in terms of expanding the economy, the economy. But virtually everyone agrees that cuts in capital gains will bring us not only an expansion in the economy, creating new jobs, but new revenues. Did you give that any thought? Certainly, Mr. Linder, we did. And I agree with you fully. The problem is we don't have an opportunity to pick and choose which of those tax cuts would go into the budget. We have to take all $700 billion over the next 10 years or nothing. Uh, we believe that what should be done is we should not incorporate all of those tax cuts into this budget, but we should look at those ways of reforming the tax code, which do, in fact, stimulate and grow the economy, capital gains being one of them. In our budget, we don't assume the plugged-in figure of $25 billion of eliminating corporate welfare, quote-unquote, that the Kasich budget does. We also don't include the capital gains cuts. But I think you'll find that capital gains is scored at about the same figure. And so what I would recommend the committee do is, and I would recommend the Congress, adopt our coalition budget. Don't include the tax cuts. Let's come back with a bill through the Ways and Means Committee that identifies that $25 billion of corporate loopholes. Let's close those and use that money to pay for a capital gains cut. And then we can both grow the economy and balance the budget, and we can do so by paying for it up front, rather than repeating again that we will cut taxes and then later, trust us, we'll cut spending, and all of this is going to work out in the end. Would you also agree that a marginal tax cut uh, would be helpful in expanding the economy? That depends. You have different economists arguing different ways about uh, the impact of a marginal tax cut, how it is divided, where it goes, what the consumption is. I personally believe that one of the greatest things we could do to encourage growth in the economy is to completely change our tax policy. I believe we ought to shift from taxing income and profits and shift to taxing consumption 
and uh, do it in a way that's border adjustable so we can compete with our foreign trading partners uh, on a level playing field. If you have but a national point of sale sales tax, you've done that. Either a, a sales tax, a broader transfer tax, a value added tax. I mean, there are several different ways that you can accomplish that. But I believe uh, this body must, sometime within the next decade, uh, shift our tax policy from that archaic policy of taxing income and profits to a policy of taxing consumption and taxing products as they flow through the economy. It is fairer, it is simpler, it is more economically uh, uh, salient. It, it also gives us the opportunity to border adjust those like every one of our major trading partners are. Right now, our products at our, are at a price disadvantage in our market and foreign markets because all of their products come into our country without their tax and without our tax. Our products, when they leave this country, carry our tax burden, and when they go into their country, they add their tax burden onto them. So all of our products are double taxed, and all of their products are tax exempt, and you simply cannot compete in an inter international trade economy with those rules. So we must make that change. The question is when we will do it and what it will look like. But it ought not to be incorporated into this budget document. I would like to do it tomorrow. <clears throat> and I would... Uh I'd like to save that $7.1 billion a year we spent on the IRS and put it into tax relief. But I do think that the national point-of-sale sales tax is the one that does exactly what you said. Uh, with the VAT tax does not. It has to be adjusted. The sales tax sends our exports overseas with no tax burden at all and brings imports to our shores tax exactly the same as domestic products. Uh, that's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frost. I would uh, direct this to Mr. Stenholm and Mr. Orton. The, uh, when we had uh, Mr. Kasich uh, before us earlier today, he was very Kasich, uh, before us earlier today, he was very ambivalent about the subject of uh, your budget being made in order. Um, I would point out that uh, when the Democrats controlled this committee and controlled the House in 1993 and 1994, we made in order a Kasich substitute and a Solomon substitute that uh, we clearly gave the uh, minority several opportunities to present substitutes. Uh, um, and I would, uh, you've heard the, the chairman, our chairman has indicated that this matter is being studied. I don't think I detected a, a commitment at this point to make their amendment in order. Um, I, Mr. Chairman, I certainly would hope that their amendment would be made in order. It is a res very responsible approach. And one well, let me let House me say to the gentleman, these the are friends of mine. And that makes a lot of difference. Well, the, the gentleman and I were on the same side <laughs> uh, two months ago, and unfortunately, he, he wasn't able to make something in order, if I recall. Uh, the, even though he's chairman of the committee, the um, uh, it's my understanding that uh, the Democratic leader, Mr. Gebhardt, has written a letter to the committee saying that in the event that. Uh, that the uh, Republican majority is not willing to make in order the uh, substitute offered by Mr. Orton and Mr. Stenholm and the others, that Mr. Gebhardt will incorporate that as his substitute. We are in receipt of the letter and without objection, we'll submit it for the record. It is very important that uh, these uh, responsible uh, conservative members of the Democratic caucus have the opportunity to present their substitute on the floor. And I believe it will attract uh, significant support. And I think it would, be, uh, uh, it would be a real disservice to the House if they were not given that opportunity. Uh, <clears throat> Mrs. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I just want to congratulate the gentleman for a good work product, and uh, uh, I really appreciate it. And I really have no further questions. Mr. Linder covered much of what I was going to ask. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> gentlemen, we, uh, again, we, uh, we respect uh, you and, uh, and your offering here today. And we certainly will uh, take it under consideration, as we will all of the other substitutes uh, for Mr. Dingell and, uh, and Mr. Uh, uh, Vislowski, I believe it is, and Mr. Uh, Schuster and a number of others. And uh, we do appreciate your coming, and uh, we'll be talking to you about it. Thank you very, very much. We're going to recess the, uh, the hearing here until uh, three minutes after the vote uh, concludes. Meeting stands in recess. And this is for the record. Right. Thank you.
Rules Committee will come to order. We are uh, very privileged to have uh, as our witnesses the co-authors of uh, an extraordinarily impressive package that uh, I've had a chance to look at and I believe will be a great help when it's considered on the House floor. Mr. Newman and Mr. Solomon and you gentlemen can proceed in whatever order you'd like. I would yield to my, my good friend uh, Mr. Newman, a freshman member of this body and an outstanding member. Happy to have you, Mr. Newman. Look forward to your testimony. Thank, thank you. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Mr. Solomon and yourself and uh, Mr. Goss for their co-sponsorship of this, along with uh, the other 28 members that are joined us as co-sponsors of this amendment. Um, about five years ago, I sold my business and came and decided to take a shot at running for Congress, and I did it basically for one reason. I realized that the debt was growing at a rate that we could not sustain as a nation. I realized the threat that this was to our children, to our grandchildren decided to sell our business and try and do something about it. This budget that we have presented, a five-year plan to balance the budget, is not something that's been developed over the last three or four months, but rather it's been developed over the last five years. When I got out here in January, I found that the work that was necessary to get the job done was already here on the Hill, and I commend the Balanced Budget Task Force for their efforts, um, along with some of the other sources of information that we've used to put this together, including some proposals from John Kasich, uh, from GAO, from CBL and from a variety of other sources that have led us to the proposal that's now before us. The plan specifically balances the budget in five years with the tax cuts as, as passed by the House of Representatives fully implemented. It does something that I heard about a lot of discussion about as we talked about the balanced budget amendment and that's that it takes Social Security completely out of the picture. Each year the Social Security system collects approximately twenty billion dollars more in tax revenues than what it pays out to our senior citizens and benefits. Under our plan, and to my knowledge, it's the only plan that's treating Social Security in this manner, we separate the Social Security surplus funds from the rest of the budget. We do not use those surplus funds in our computations to balance the budget. The third significant difference in this plan is that we have a detailed proposal as to how we would go about repaying the federal debt over a 30-year period of time. I consider it our moral and ethical responsibility to our children, to our grandchildren, to do something about this debt that's grown so rapidly since 1980 in particular, and do something to pass this nation on to our children in debt-free status. So we did include a detailed plan in, in terms of how to go about repaying the debt over a period of time. The plan is very different than the um, plan that was presented by this morning by the Chairman of the Budget Committee in that rather than make specific decisions as to exactly where we make the spending reductions on a category-by-category -category basis, our plan provides enough spending reductions in the suggestion part, in the menu part, to meet all the targets, but then it suggests an additional $70 billion in, in spending reductions so that the committees can go about making selections from the menu from the roadmap section of our proposal. So again, we've provided not only spending reductions to meet all of our targets, but suggestions to go $70 billion beyond that so that the, city, the decisions as to what actually is reduced and what is not reduced is made at the committee level whether it be the authorizing committee or appropriations in the future. The other significant difference in this plan is that over the period of seven years, we will find our nation $600 billion less in debt if our five-year plan is passed versus the seven-year plan. There's a $600 billion savings in debt accumulation over the seven-year period of time. And I'd like to point out that the interest alone at a 7% rate on this $600 billion is $42 billion a year. When people talk about balancing the budget in five years versus seven years, they all think, they seem to think that doing it in seven years is a lot easier than doing it in five. But when you really look at the additional accumulation of debt over that period of time, it becomes very clear that the interest on that extra accumulated debt eats up a lot of the surplus revenue that's collected as you push this out. What is not eaten up by the additional interest payment, the vast majority of the remainder is eaten up by the fact that Medicare is going to go up during that period of time as well. Beyond that, we have Medicare in, uh, Medicaid increases. Between all of those increases, we find that it's not really very much easier to do it over a seven-year period of time than it is a five-year period of time. I would contend that doing it in five years, saving the $600 billion from being added to our federal debt is another very significant reason to um, push this plan forward. To summarize then, there are really four di basic differences between our plan and the plan that was presented earlier this morning by the Chairman of the Budget Committee. 
Ours balances the budget in five years versus seven. We do not use the surplus Social Security revenues in our computations to balance the budget. We provide a menu, a suggested way of reaching it as opposed to specific manners of going about reducing spending with $70 billion in additional reductions as, as potential options. And we pass the final decisions on to the committees as opposed to making decisions in our budget. And perhaps one of the more significant things, the last thing, is that it does save $600 billion in total debt accumulation over the seven-year period of time. Thank you. Well, I must say, sitting, uh, sitting down here looking up at you, August gentlemen, uh, is different. And uh, they're rather intimidating, don't you they think? Are. Huh? That they are. <laughs> <laughs> you, mean, you mean we look different? Uh, you, you really do look different from down here. But, uh, but now I know why I have such great uh, respect and hold you in such awe. You know, uh, Mark Newman just uh, mentioned in his uh, closing remarks that... Uh, our proposal accumulates $600 billion less in accumulated debt over the same seven-year period. And I guess, Mark, that's really the reason that we're here. Because, as I told Chairman Kasich and the Budget Committee members, they really have done a magnificent job in putting together a budget that really does make the cuts that are so difficult, such hard medicine, but bring this to a balanced budget at the end of seven years. And the only argument, uh, and let me just uh, digress for a minute, saying that they do almost everything that we do. In other words, they eliminate 150 programs like the Interstate Commerce Commission. They privatize 125 government agencies like the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, they consolidate 35 government functions like the Bureau of Indian Affairs, we do all that too. Uh, they defund <clears throat> literally dozens and dozens of the 410 entitlement programs out there. And gentlemen, you'd be shocked if you read each of those 410 programs, entitlement programs. I mean, these, this is unbelievable, where we actually have entitlement programs that affect people in Africa, entitlement programs dealing with elephants and what have you. <clears throat> but you know, we abolish the Department of Education. We, uh, we uh, abolish the Department of Commerce. We abolish the Department of Energy. We do uh, basically what, uh, what the uh, Republican uh, proposal does. But the difference is, and I would just point to the chart that was handed out in, uh, in, in front of you. And if you look at the top line, that is the Republican alternative. And if you notice it, it goes kind of up in an arc and then begins to go down. But it begins to go down severely only in the last two years. If you look at the Newman-Solomon uh, Balanced Budget Task Force Freshman Republican Alternative, if you look at that line below the straight line, it takes a severe drop in the two years. And therefore, that severe drop in the first two years carries over for the entire seven years. And that's worth $600 billion. That means that of the, 500, uh, of the $5 trillion accumulated debt that we have today, we won't be adding a $1 trillion like the President of the United States has, has requested in his budget, and we'll be adding $600 billion less than the Republican alternative or any other alternative, even that of the, um, of the uh, Democrat conservative uh, uh, consortium. So the point is that if you don't deal with this now, you may never deal with it. If you don't get at the root of all of these causes in the first two years, it probably won't happen. You won't get to the fifth and sixth year. And again, I'll call you, recall you to my original testimony. In 1985, I was so proud to be a part of that Graham Rudman bill, because that would have led us to a balanced budget by 1991. Didn't have all those details in it, but with those caps, it would have done it. But you know what happened? Two years later. And we met those, those cap restrictions every year for the first two years, just like we're going to do with the Solomon uh, Newman budget or with the, with the Kasich budget. But there was another election in 1987. And lo and behold, that new makeup of the Congress decided it was too difficult, in spite of a really moving economy, more revenues coming into the federal government than there had been in the previous years. And yet, they, with all those newfound revenues, they couldn't stick with those caps, and they exceeded them. 
And then, two years after that, there was another election, and they completely abandoned Graham Redmond. Now, that is, all, that is my real argument with the, with the Republican alternative, the official budget, is the fact that it's a good budget, it does exactly what we want it to do, but it doesn't do it in the early years. It does it in years six and seven. And ladies and gentlemen, six and seven may never get here. So if you're serious, if we really are serious, we can do this. This budget that we're proposing is no more difficult, no more, it's not any bad, more bad medicine to the American people than any of the other proposals. But it does it early on, and it does it with the bureaucracy here in Washington. It restructures the federal government. It does it in the first two years while this Congress is still sitting. That means that a new Congress coming in, if they want to change it back, then they've got to go through the whole reauthorization. They've got to, and then they've got to vote for it. They've got to pass it. The way it's set up with the Republican budget is they can merely make some of these light cuts in the first couple of years, and then they can build them back up again without any reauthorization, without anything. That's really the difference in our proposal. And that's why I hope that uh, this committee is going to see fit. Uh, and I'll use whatever persuasion I have to uh, try to, to make the, the Newman-Solomon uh, freshman Republican balanced task force budget in order, and let's have that debate on the floor. And I thank the gentleman and stand ready to Thank you, gentlemen. It appears that we have another we have witness who would like to, uh, Mr. Smith, would you like to make a statement in support of? Uh... Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a brief statement uh, for the committee. When uh, the freshman Republicans uh, began our lives together in December, actually. We came together and a group of us got together and said the most important thing that we're going to do is balance the budget and we want to do it sooner than later. And a group of us that uh, got together decided that making the decisions up front instead of later was also more important. Otherwise, making the decisions in a way that would make the deficit reduction go on, not putting those decisions off to later or making the decisions ones that could be terminated later. And so with that, when uh, Mark became the guru of our group, when it came to the budget, he came up with a plan that we worked with him that made some of those decisions earlier. Uh, I began with what became one of the first ones to support his final plan. Uh, and it became, to me, uh, a statement of we will do it, and we will do it now as the American people have said that we should do, instead of some budget that does a little now with the promise of a lot later. The American people have been, uh, you might say, duped on that before. And they don't trust us a whole lot right now. And they're hearing an awful lot of rhetoric as to why we should never balance the budget. But I think when they see that we do something that actually does it now, makes the tough decisions now, they will start having confidence in this Congress again. So for that reason, the freshman coalition that is so much behind the Newman-Solomon budget, um, uh, for that reason, we are coming together and endorsing it with everything and all the votes that we can muster and would encourage you to please put it on the floor so that we do have a chance to vote for this budget. In conclusion, I think that when you look at this budget, it's one way. When you look at the budget earlier, it's another way. But there's no question that we can do it with this many ideas before us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Smith. Uh, I appreciate the testimony from uh, all three of you. And I'd, I'd like to uh, begin by just asking a couple of questions. As a, I'm a co-sponsor, an original co-sponsor of this measure, in large part because you uh, take on an issue that is rather controversial, and that is uh, the Small Business Administration. Everyone strongly supports the small business sector of our economy. 95% of the jobs created are created by the small business sector. The innovation in this country doesn't emerge uh, from uh, large universities uh, to the extent that it does from garages owned by small business men and women. And at the same time, uh, I've concluded that uh, there are good aspects to the SBA, but it has uh, unfortunately provided a subsidized competitive advantage over many who have to rely on the private marketplace for sources of credit, and they have a huge bureaucracy. And some of the things that are very helpful within the SBA uh, include uh, things like disaster relief. But I don't believe that in the Eisenhower administration, when it was established, it was ever intended to be the source for those who are victims of disasters for, for relief. 
And so I uh, would just like to hear any thoughts that you might have about uh, the SBA and your plans within the budget. Well, I'd, <clears throat> I'd be glad to, <clears throat> to speak to it. Uh, we will be in the uh, next couple of days, probably on Thursday, uh, offering a tandem bill to these uh, budget proposals, which will consist of $900 billion. That's $900 billion in specific cuts throughout the entire federal budget. And it covers a lot of the uh, issues that I've mentioned here today that, that we have uh, assumptions in, in our budget. Uh, the Small Business Administration is one of them. And uh, you have to, uh, you really have to search your soul when you want to cut something like the Small Business Administration. But I can tell you, having been here for 17 years and having when I first got here, really worked so hard to develop the Small Business Administration and loans in my district. And we were very, very successful. As a matter of fact, I used to list them year after year, how proud I was. And then all of a sudden, it turned out that I helped one small businessman who was not a successful businessman. As a matter of fact, he was very unsuccessful. He had gone to three banks and been turned down and couldn't get a line of credit. And that's one of the criteria for getting a small business loan. So we went to bat and we, we really pounded heads. And you know what? We got him that loan. He shouldn't have had it because he got the loan. He stayed in business for a few years. But what he did was put a, another businessman in the exact same business who had to go and pay the higher interest rates and put him out of business. So were we really helping anybody in this situation? We helped to subsidize a, a failure, a business failure who should not have been in business. So Did his business ultimately fail then too? It his failed. ultimately after stuck, that couple year period. The, uh, so basically the U.S. taxpayer is the uh, last potential source after the private marketplace has turned someone down. So, you know, in my opinion, the, the best thing we can do is to control these deficits. We mentioned during the, uh, the hearing earlier uh, a young couple with a mortgage of $75,000 and how that cu accumulated $5 trillion debt amounts to 37,000 additional dollars. In other words, the debt is higher by the, uh, the interest payments are higher on that national debt by 2% because of the $5 trillion in competition with the private sector. And consequently, the best thing we can do is to, is to get these deficits under control, eliminate the deficit at the year 2025, and that's going to do more for every small businessman in America than anything else we can do. They create 75% of all the new jobs in America every single year annually. They're the people we ought to be helping, and we do that. And you can't do it without, uh, my good friend Tony Hall says, be family friendly. Uh, you can't do it unless you really tighten your belt with everyone out there. And that's really what we're doing in order to get our hands on this deficit. Right. I just add my two cents worth. Um, this is an area that's very near and dear to me. I started in business. It took me five tries to get my first mm -hmm. loan. I got turned down at four places before I wound up getting a loan at a bank. And uh, it was really the persistence to keep going back and asking and asking until we finally got one to lend us the money to start our business. Our business over a 10-year period of time went on to be uh, in a situation where we were able to provide jobs to over 250 people in southeastern Wisconsin and uh, it was a matter of keeping on looking and, and staying at it with the determination to get the loan. The second thing I would say is that by doing our five-year balance budget plan and balancing the budget, there's going to be $600 billion that is not borrowed by the federal government. That $600 billion is available out in the private sector and frankly I see no need for the Small Business Administration if we take $600 billion that the federal government was going to borrow and put it, make it available for private sector uh, capitalization and borrowing. Uh, <clears throat> the other, other point I make is the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, you know, that's one of the items that I know there were some challenges and they, I was told it would be very costly to shift in the direction of closing that down, but I know many people have been very supportive of the idea of doing that. How exactly do you treat that? Over, over a period of time it needs to be addressed. Again, I come from the home building business, so I've got some experience with that. There are areas in this that work very well. Some of the uh, private mortgage insurance on single family housing, for example, is, is a reasonably good program. There are other areas that don't work at all. Mm -hmm. And we're spending a small fortune that we should not be spending. The money is not reaching the poor people, and we need to reevaluate and revamp how we're doing this. I'm in that same building of business myself. 
uh, with my family, and I've got to tell you that one of the things that we concluded is that the elimination of the Department of Housing and Urban Development could wipe out the three-year waiting list for Section 8 housing if it were to be turned over to com local community housing authorities. I think that I mean, we really need to head into that direction. Mr. Quillen. Thank you very much. I commend the three of you for offering the substitute, and I know you've given it a lot of thought, and you've come up with something that uh, would be immediate, and I think that's what the people want. I've seen the balanced budget discussions, and as the Chairman uh, Solomon alluded to, in two to four years, they all go away. And I attribute the Rules Committee action as part of that problem because they would always, this committee would always waive the budget. And reaching a balanced budget, if you waive the budget requirement, then you never reach a balanced budget. I think it's necessary to have teeth in whatever we do because we can't violate what we're trying to accomplish. If we do, we're just all down the drain. So I commend you and thank, thank you sir. for being here. Uh, I enjoyed the uh, testimony very much. Uh, the thing that bothered me a little bit, I represent a very urban area, and we depend very much upon HUD and all those ho housing programs. Uh, and I was just wondering if there were certain programs in HUD that you were looking at that were probably not as productive as others. Uh, are you just looking at the entire HUD program? Uh, organization. Um, the way we've treated that in our budget resolution is we have suggested a series of things for the actual committees and subcommittees to take up and review. Um, my opinion is that the expertise to make the appropriate decisions to help direct the most dollars to the neediest people, that expertise exists at the committee and at the subcommittee level at both authorizing and appropriations. For that reason, we've suggested a whole series of potential reductions which of course will be taken out of here to the committees um, without specifying exactly which one should go through. So I, mm. uh, you know, do you want my opinions on it? Did some of the multifamily loans that have been made appear to be in trouble uh, sitting on that committee from what I've heard. The single family private mortgage insurance seems to be working very well. The uh, cost per recipient family seems to be high to me uh, in the range of $400 per family. I would like to start making sure that we get $400 per family out to the poor people that need the money as opposed to um, it getting eaten up in the bureaucracy someplace in between. But again, the way this has been handled in our budget resolution is that we've provided a series of potential um, spending reductions uh, without specifying exactly which ones. There's more than enough to meet our targets, and we would leave that to the committees to make the decisions on which ones to do. That's good. Uh, you know, housing is, as I say, is very important in many areas. Uh, every time uh, one of these housing programs are going to come to the close, uh, all the elderly and all the people who are affected by it just get all upset and, you know, probably puts another, uh, takes another 20 years off their lives. And, and it'd be nice to be able to give them some kind of feeling of uh, uh, security. Uh, is it? runs with some of those programs. I know some of the Section 8 programs have been gold mines for people. You know, they're just, uh, the, you get your money up front and, and then there were other programs that were, they did the job, but they were very, very uh, economically healthy for the developers that had the, the positions. So I, it's a big, big problem added to the other problems, but I'm very happy that I heard you, uh, you know, mention it. Good. One of the uh, co-authors of the us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I uh, obviously am delighted that uh, we seem to have a, uh, an abundance of good choices uh, this year when we're talking about uh, budgets. It's a distinct difference in previous years. Um, I think that... Uh, gentleman yield? Of course. <laughs> we have an abundance of choices so far. But I wonder when we get up here to vote out the, the choices that we should allow the entire House to vote upon, whether that abundance of choice will still be there. <laughs> well, I think... a very friendly bunch to me up there. Um, my guess is that the distinguished there we are. ranking member will know that, that of the abundance of good choices that I have, we will pick the very best choices for the members. So I think the members will have the same good choices as we do. Um, 
I, I think that there are some very important points, and I, f I came in a moment late, and I don't know whether they were uh, discussed or not. But the fact is that this budget, I think, does is perhaps the best job of any of all the work, and it's no surprise because the work has been going on so long. Mr. Solomon from New York, as we all know, has been ferreting out waste, fraud, abuse, and targeting it for a number of years and embarrassing some of us uh, early on to vote for the early attempts of this when it was very lonely. But he's been absolutely right. And I think this is one of the greatest compilations. And to be linked up with Mr. Newman's uh, expertise on how to crunch the numbers and put it into a budget uh, format, uh, and to take these kinds of waste, fraud, and abuse targets and, and uh, put them in a package like this, I think it's a, a very happy circumstance. Would the gentleman yield? Of course. Uh, the gentleman is very uh, modest in not stating that he, for a number of years, has done the same thing, working long and hard, putting together a litany of items that should be targeted. And I think that the record should show that Mr. Goss has been very diligent. I think $200 billion of the $900 billion uh, came out of his, uh, his work. I thank the gentleman for their... Uh their, uh, Gentlemen, Neil, <laughs> yes. if you're doing that well, it wasn't your 200 billion. <laughs> yield, of if, you, if you're doing that well, will it stick around a little longer? <laughs> yes, uh, thanks, Mr. But the other point I don't know if it was brought out is that that uh, I think uh, Mr. Solomon has has offered flexibility because I know when we got into this program, the idea was if you don't like what's in this, you come up with your own. Just make the number come out the same, and I think that's a great challenge for any member of this institution to deal with that. The last thing I'll say very quickly is that I've only lived through two budget proposals up here where uh, they w we were going to have this great uh, effective uh, budget cuts and it was all going to come to pass and I got in on the tail end of uh, uh, the one that you uh, referred to first, Graham, Graham Rudman. Rudman. And uh, there are two assumptions you always make in budgets, it seems. One is that the cuts are going to come in the out years and the other is the out years are never going to come. And uh, that's one of the reasons we're in the hole we're in, and I think this uh, remedies that problem. And I congratulate you and look forward to getting on with it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do want to congratulate you. Uh, I've always believed that the best thing we could do would be some kind of a freeze to treat everyone equally. I'm convinced that America is willing to tighten up their belts and equally sacrifice. And um, you sure have tightened some belts in this budget, but uh, it's what the time requires. We desperately need to get to balance our children and grandchildren will not have their entire future mortgaged as we're doing it now. So I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. I want to commend the group as well. I think the, uh, uh, the courage and hard work and the dedication and the spirit of the freshman class uh, coupled with the old bull we have on the other end of the table, our chairman, Mr. Solomon, that the know-how that he uh, brings to the equation, and he has been doing this for years and years himself, um, really it makes for, for, for a good final product. And it, uh, it's a very courageous final project, and I applaud all of you and wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished members, uh, I uh, join the, the words of my colleagues in uh, congratulating this uh, distinguished group uh, for this uh, effort. Uh, I think it's another example of the fact that we're not going to waste this historic opportunity uh, to uh, save the economic future of the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you all very much. We appreciate your uh, testimony. And uh, we'll proceed with our next panel. Thank you very much, gentlemen and the lady. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman's mic was not on, uh, but uh, we want to welcome uh, both of you gentlemen uh, before us and feel free to summarize your statements if you care to. Your entire statement will appear in the record uh, without objection. And uh, who will speak first? I will, Mr. Chairman. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, as chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, I appreciate the opportunity to come before the Rules Committee today to request that the caucus be given the opportunity under rule to bring an alternative budget to the House floor. As you know, for several years, 
the caucus has crafted a budget which offers a different course from that presented by the House Budget Committee. This year we call our plan the Caring Majority Alternative Budget. Our blueprint for the future of this great nation reflects our concern over what we see as America's greatest needs. The need for stable jobs, better educational opportunities, housing and health care. In addition, our budget contains a tax cut for working people struggling to raise families in these uncertain times. We share the concern of the Republican majority over the heavy burden of debt our nation continues to carry, a debt which began growing in leaps and bounds during the 1980s. I'm happy to say that our plan does indeed produce a balanced budget by the year 2002. My friend and colleague, Congressman Major Owens, has worked tirelessly in his role as chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus's Alternative Task Force to develop a fair, balanced, and effective budget plan. Congressman Owens will explain the details of our budget to the committee. Again, Mr. Chairman, let me thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. I hope that the Rules Committee will agree that the budget process is so important that the inclusion of all ideas and points of view is crucial. Thank you very much. At this time, I yield to the chairman of our budget committee, Congressman Owens. <clears throat> Mr. Owens, you uh, have the floor, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Rules Committee, I want to thank you for allowing us to continue the tradition we've established in presenting the Congressional Black Caucus budget. And over the years, we've come with a unique point of view on most of the budgets, and we again think we can add a great deal to this very important debate. I'd just like to present the section of our package, uh, pages four and five, entitled Summary of the Congressional Black Caucus Care and Majority Alternative Budget. Uh, we, this alternative budget uh, does meet your mandate, uh, the mandate that's been established by the majority to provide a balanced budget by the year 2002. However, this budget, which we've chosen to call the Carrying Majority Budget, is balanced with a minimum of pain and suffering. We've actually provided some increases in important activities like education. We propose to invest more than $27 billion in education over seven years, increasing the Function 500 budget by 25%. Most important of all, we rejected the notion that the Department of Education should be drastically and dangerously downsized or completely liquidated. Uh, we would like, in conclusion, you know, this uh, budget uh, focuses in on a problem which has been ignored, and that is the problem of uh, that most Americans are worried about in terms of increases in taxes and the climbing tax burden of individuals. The individual income tax burden has gone up drastically uh, from a period in 1943 when the individual uh, income taxes was 27.1 percent of the total tax burden, uh, and 30, and the corporate income tax burden was 39.8 percent. We reached a point where at this uh, point in uh, 1994 the individual portion of the total tax burden is 43.2 percent and the corporate income uh, portion of that burden is 11.2 percent. So our budget deals with that problem. We have balanced the budget by closing corporate tax loopholes and by ending corporate welfare. Uh, our budget cuts spending by 518, 518 billion dollars over the seven year period, but it closes loopholes and makes tax adjustments toward fairness uh, to the tune of $583 billion in increases in the corporate responsibility. Actually, this increases the corporate tax only from the 11.1% to 11.2% to 15.9%. Uh, we think that there is much to be learned by taking a close look at what we've done. With a minimum of pain, we can deal with the problem of the increasing burden on individuals, uh, the personal income tax burden while at the same time adjusting the tax uh, responsibilities in a fairer way. In conclusion, the Congressional Black Caucus Karen Majority Alternative Budget provides for an expenditure of $1.6 trillion for fiscal year 1976, and by the year 2002, our budget projections show an annual level of just over $2.1 trillion with an equal amount of revenue to meet the requirement of a balanced budget. We have used the same sources that the other that the Majority Budget Committee has used and other uh, budget presentations have used. In many cases, uh, our figures have come directly out of the Majority uh, Budget Committee's uh, considerations. Uh, we 
uh, hope that we'll have a chance to again present this budget as an important alternative to the other budgets that will be on the floor of the House. Thank you. <coughs> well, Mr. Payne and uh, Mr. Owens, my colleague from New York, um, as you know, I um, approached you a couple of weeks ago uh, and told you that it would be our intention to try and make an order a legitimate substitute if you uh, wanted to offer one as you have in the past and uh, I'm glad to see that you've uh, exercised that uh, and, and come before us. Uh, we don't, uh, we have not prepared the rule yet, uh, but uh, certainly uh, historically we've, uh, we've allowed a substitute by your caucus and uh, at your request why we will certainly give it, uh, I hope, favorable consideration. And we appreciate your coming before us. Mr. Goss. Chairman, I think testimony is clear. By my calculations, uh, basically the way you've achieved this is uh, you've got about a $900 billion to pay for all of the programs you want to do, and $700 billion comes out of basically corporate tax, and $200 billion or so comes out of defense. Is that about it? Well, we, we have uh, spending That's cuts. About the way total I... $518 billion, and uh, defense is cut about, about in the year two. 2002, defense is running at the rate of an $80 billion cut uh, under the current uh, budget. Related to, uh, I'm again relating our numbers to the, um, the committee resolution, the Kasich budget, shows that the difference there, that you would cut defense spending in addition to what they've done, uh, an additional $201 billion over the next seven years. And in addition to that, uh, you would increase taxes on business by uh, 695.32 billion over the next seven years. Uh, those two numbers come out to uh, just shy of 900 billion. Um, and then with that, you uh, get involved in uh, uh, providing a tax credit equal to 20 percent of, of the uh, FICA contribution cap to 200, which is going to eat up some of that. And then the rest, I presume, is pretty much savings. Yeah, I think that I made, about, I made the analysis. That's the description we that have, sounds, and I presume sounds, it's about right. It's, it's about Thank you very much. Budget debate will begin Tuesday on the House floor. Members will convene at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, and you can see live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage here on CBS.